Anyhow, I'm going to be talking about free cloud storage and some of the different cloud storage flavors there are. You would be amazed at the number of different things and different services. I'll also address some security concerns and a, a disclaimer. I am most familiar with Microsoft Windows uh, and to a lesser extent, uh, various flavors of Unix and Linux. I confess to a great deal of ignorance on iPhone, iPad, and Macintosh. If there is someone out there that has uh, you know, more knowledge than I do, I will I, I welcome your comments. I guess, first of all, uh, let's define cloud storage. Cloud storage is data stored on servers that are accessed across a network. And there are a few different storage clouds. There's the public cloud. And basically, the data is stored on servers accessed through the internet. The servers are managed by a cloud service provider and shared between many of the provider's customers. The storage of each customer is either physically or logically, meaning by software, isolated from other customers so that no customer can read or write data that belongs to, now that doesn't belong to them. One of the nice things about public cloud storage is that the cloud provider manages the storage. Uh, you get what's called just-in-time capacity, meaning that the cloud provider has a large pool of unused storage. And if you need a little more storage, uh, you'll automatically get it up to the limits of your contract. Contract. Examples of the public cloud storage are that provided by Amazon AWS, Google Cloud, or Microsoft's Azure. There's a private cloud storage, and basically a private cloud lives in your company's own data centers, or I guess it could be uh, a private data center somewhere, and it may be accessed across the internet. Private clouds are less expensive than public clouds, but require a lot more effort to maintain them. The owner has to, has to uh, control the firewalls and physical security to protect the servers and data, as well as applying any software patches and replacing outdated hardware. The owner must carefully control the amount of storage available. Uh, if you have too little storage, you're in danger of running out of storage. Uh, you can't store your data. That would be a very bad thing. But on the other hand, if you've got too much storage, you've wasted a lot of money on storage that just never gets used. Then we have something called own cloud. And that's storage that's stored on your premises. Although it's accessed over the network, it sits behind your firewall. It's accessible over your LAN rather than the internet. For example, in my house, I've got a small uh, desktop system running a product called Sigma NAS. It's a flavor of BSD Unix, and basically it provides a little over a terabyte of shared storage to all the computers in my house. Uh, some of the reasons to use cloud storage is it's simply easy to use. The cl cloud provides a convenient method of getting your files into and out of the cloud. Uh, so some services even appear as if they were a directory on your computer, or they might appear as a complete hard drive with their own drive letter. Data can tr be transferred by drag and drop or copy. Uh, and it can even be directly accessed by word processors, spreadsheets, or any other piece of software that accesses files. Data protection. Uh, cloud data, at least on the public cloud, is accessed through, uh, is stored across a bunch of redundant servers, meaning that if one data, cent data center is experienced problems or even destroyed, there is a shadow copy of your data on a server in another data center. Cloud storage, yes. 
Yeah. Yeah. Right. And we don't hear the uh, person's in the room. Okay, uh, George WB2IKT was asking, uh, what is the interval that I guess data that's shared across data centers is destroyed? Okay. Um, are you talking about data that you no longer need or basically data that has changed? Let's say you have stored some files or some videos. Right. And shadow is elsewhere. And the data center that you're using to treat, you don't know this because it's on the cloud. Right. Something happens, it just becomes unavailable. What is the mechanism of that? Are you going to get into that? Uh, the, no, if the data center is lost, what's the mechanism of bringing it? Uh, it would typically, the amount of time it would take if, if a, let's say one of, uh, you know, watching a video would be one of YouTube's data center goes down. Uh, the amount of time it would take is probably might not even be noticeable or you would see uh, a slot a pause for a few seconds in the video and then it would resume uh if it's a period of high activity i'm guessing that it would take longer okay uh okay Okay, sharing data between devices. Uh, sharing device, sharing data between devices, for example, a smartphone and a PC, can sometimes be a challenge. You need to copy from, let's say, the smartphone where it lives to some intermediate storage like a thumb drive, uh, and then connect that thumb drive to another system and copy the data back. Uh, with cloud storage, uh, a piece of software is installed on each one of the computers accessing it, and then the data is available to any system with an internet connection uh, almost as soon as the data is created. Uh, this is especially important now that we're all carrying small computers around with us uh, all the time. These small computers are smartphones and tablets. so. Basically, you might create something on your home computer and want it immediately available on your, uh, your phone. Convenience. Uh, you know, cloud storage is convenient in the fact that you may have to install a client or a piece of software on your device, but that's done once, as opposed to uh, if you move data around with, let's say, a thumb drive, uh, every time you have to copy the data, you need to plug the thumb drive in, copy the data from the system that it was created or updated on, and then disconnect it, put it to the other system. Uh, and as, as with any good software, the cloud client should notify you when there's an update available. Another thing is scalability. If you're getting close to using the amount of storage that you have contracted for, let's say I've got a license for you know, 200 gigabytes. Uh, all you need to do is update your contract, call up the vendor and say, hey, I need more storage. Can you give me another 100 gigabytes? And he'll say, fine, it'll cost you uh, whatever a month. Uh, if you're lo using local storage, what you'd have to do is you'd have to go out and buy a piece of hardware uh, another hard drive, let's say, to expand your storage, and then you'd have to install that new hard drive. Uh, it's a lot more complicated than uh, you know, just updating your contract, say, okay, I want more storage. Poof, it's there. There are a couple of reasons uh, why you don't want to use cloud storage. Uh, for public cloud storage, you're dependent on the internet. If your internet connection goes down or it's slow, 
access to the data in the cloud is either degraded or gone completely. Also, well, one thing that bothers some people is that cloud storage means handing over control of your information to a third party company. Uh, before you store data in the cloud, you need to have faith in the cloud provider and that they are capable of keeping your data secure. Uh, in the past, things have, have gone wrong with cloud storage companies. Am I changing slides? Uh, I will when there's a new slide. Okay. <laughs> okay. Right now is just a background of cloud storage. I've got pictures of stuff. <laughs> okay. Um, anyhow, wh why do companies give you free storage? Um, well, their business is selling storage, and they're hoping that when you use up the limited amount of free storage, you'll like their product and use more storage, and they'll be glad to sell it to you. Amazon gives you free storage with Prime membership in the hopes that will inspire you to join or renew Amazon Prime. Uh, also, Amazon has services for printing as well as making plaques, calendars, mouse pads, and a whole bunch of stuff from your photo. Uh, they charge for these services, so they're happy to give you unlimited service to uh, save your prints. Uh, and as, as George pointed out the other week, uh, they only give you five gigabytes for your photos. Well, I, I think part of that is because they really sell no product that uses your video. So they have no way of monetizing it. There are photo sites like Snapfish and Shutterfly that offer free uh, photo storage as a way of marketing their products. You know, you need to store something on their storage to make the prints, cards, or calendars that they sell. Now, all of these sites are also hoping that when you acquire storage for your personal use, You'll be impressed with the quality of the service and the ease it is to use it. And this will cause you to uh, use them uh, in your professional life. So basically your company will uh, buy this type of service. Okay, uh, as I said, there are many types of cloud storage services and I'm gonna go over just a few of them. This is Ah, here we go. Uh, live transmission is edited. Okay, when we think of cloud storage services, the first thing that comes to mind are sites like Dropbox, OneDrive, and Google Drive, where the storage operates like an extension of your hard drive storage. Uh, in this example, we see OneDrive. Uh, looking here in our file explorer, this area highlighted in yellow uh, is OneDrive, uh, and it uh, is displayed on the Windows 10 uh, file explorer, and it looks just like any other so storage on my machine. Uh, there are other people that provide this type of storage, including OneDrive from Microsoft, uh, which gives you five gigabytes, Google Drive, which gives you 15 gigabytes, Dropbox, which gives you two gigabytes, and iCloud, which gives you five gigabytes. Uh, there's something known as a web uh, cloud storage. Uh, basically what they do, uh, web storage depositories, they lack some of the convenience of just being able to ac some, access something as a a hard drive uh, because what they do is they ask you to upload your data to their service you can create folders and upload files there uh, they're not synchronized but the, the storage is less expensive uh, the example here i'm using is something called mega.nz uh, what you do is you log on to the website uh, you upload the files. The screen is the upload screen. Um, okay, and then when you want to get the file back, you log on again. 
You click on the file name. For example, here are some field day photos in a zip file. Uh, you select download from the right click menu and you download the file. In order to do this, you must be logged into their service. Uh, if you do not, now, if you've got other folks that you want to share the storage with, uh, you, know, you may not want to share your account with them. So what you can do is you can simply send them a link to the file uh, by clicking uh, manage link. And here we go. Uh, okay, here we go. Send a file to someone. Um, I'm at the right place. Uh, nope, I'm not at the right place. Okay. And basically, uh, okay, this is, okay, this is just uh, uploading and downloading from Mega. Uh, here's another service uh, called Hightail. It used to be called um, uh, You Send It. Ah, good, I've got some help. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Basically, you again upload your files. You click here to send the file to someone. Uh, you can then uh, either, you, you can just send them a link to the file by clicking here, copy uh, link, or you can have a separate uh, decryption key. You might want to uh, add some security by emailing them the link to the file and then uh, let's say texting them the decryption key. So basically if somebody has control of their email, you still uh, you are sending the SMS message with the decryption key. So unless you have both pieces of information, you can't, uh, you can't download that file. Okay, another possibility is when you want to send a file to someone, you email it to them. But we've all had the problem where we try to email someone a file, but it's too large to be accepted. Um, and that will depend on the recipient's email provider as to how much storage they will allow. First thing you try to do is you try to compress the file to uh, like zip or gzip or 7-zip. If that doesn't work, Okay, you can send a file to a special web server uh, and just email the, uh, a link to the file. Uh, one provider of this service is Hightail, what was previously known as you send it. So I uploaded the file. I click on this link, which says send it. And oops, I can then format an email message which basically has a subject. I say here, it's a field day meeting. And I have a little message which says, that describes what the file is. Click send and it will be, and a link to the file will be sent to that person. When that person gets the file, they gets the email, they click on the link and Basically, all they've got to do is that will bring them to the Hightail site. And basically, they can just click download, or if you uploaded multiple files, you can download them all or individual files. Uh, these, the provider of this type of service to email a link is Hightail.com. And also, if you're using Mozilla Thunderbird as your email, provider uh, or email client, there is a service called Mozilla Thunderbird file link send. You'll find it in the extensions for Thunderbird. Hey, there are some sites that specialize in different types of data. One of them is Snapfish. Basically, they will allow you to, sh to store um, you know, an unlimited number of files on their servers because we've all got hundreds of files on our smartphones. Uh, we upload them to you know, Snapfish, which allows us to, there we go, 
uh, you know, view them on our screen. And of course, um, so some of these sites even have a, an app that you can put on your smartphone. As soon as you take a picture, it's automatically uploaded, or you can tell it, don't upload until I'm on Wi-Fi or until I'm charging my phone so you don't kill your battery. And some of the providers of this type of storage are Snapfish, Shutterfly, Google Photos, and Amazon Photos. Uh, one thing about Snapfish, uh, all of these will allow you to store an unlimited number of uh, photos. However, what Snapfish does is if you have not bought anything from them within one year, they do what's called archiving your photos. They store them in a slower uh, type of storage. So what you then have to do is if you come back after a year and say, I want to view my photos, they'll say, okay, wait, we'll re reload them. Okay, there are other types of specialized cloud storage. One of them, uh, there's even a special uh, cloud storage for hams. One example is Logbook of the World. You can upload your QSOs, apply for awards, uh, and, you know, and you do this without the hassle of dealing with QSL, bu uh, QSL bureaus or waiting weeks or even months for that special DX card to arrive in the mail. Uh, ham providers of cloud storage are Logbook of the World, which is ARRL, QRZ.com, and Clublog.org. Uh, none of these have a limit. Uh, one of the things that I have done professionally is programming, and there's cloud storage for programmers. Are you listening, Lou? Uh, you can save, commit all your changes as you work, and you have the ability to even see what has changed. Uh, and you can restore back to a previous uh, point if you've really screwed things up. Uh, here I just show an example of what I've done. The screen on the left is the original. And I just have item one, item two, item four, item four, and item six. And I realized, oh my goodness, I've messed up the order. So I've fixed it over here on the screen to the right, and I can have it show me what kind of changes it made. It inserted an item between two and four. It inserted item three, and the second item four was changed to item five. Um, and the providers here are Azure DevOps, which is Microsoft, uh, Atlassian Bitbucket, uh, both of those are free uh, for small projects of up to five developers with no limit. And there's GitHub, which uh, gives you a limit of two gigabytes. Okay. As I mentioned, there's own cloud storage. Basically, you can provide your own cloud storage in, on your network, in your house. In my house, I've got a desktop PC running a program called Sigma NAS. This, this allows me to share the same storage between all the PCs in my house. It's uh, also compatible with Android, iOS, and Mac OS. And if you'll notice here, basically Sigma NAS is uh, on my file explorer. It looks like a directory. And there, these are all the files in the directory. Well. Uh, you know, they're not directly on my PC, but rather on my Sigma NAS server down in the basement. Okay, that's, I guess, uh, enough on the different types. As you can see, there's lots of stuff that can be done with cloud storage, and it can be specialized for different applications. Uh, one of the questions I'm sure you're going to ask is, can I trust my cloud provider? And of course, the answer is maybe. Uh, going with one of the larger providers uh, like Google, Apple, or Microsoft is a fairly safe choice. They make a lot of money providing storage for businesses. Uh, so a security issue, even with uh, free storage for individuals, is going to make people 
lose trust in their product and cost them business. So they are doing their best to protect their data. Um, you know, you, you need to be part of the security plan too. I mean, you know, it, it's great that uh, you know, your storage provider is protecting your data, but you know, your data is on devices. Don't leave your devices unlocked. Have them automatically lock after a certain period of time so nobody can pick them up and see the secret files. Also, make sure that all paths to your data are equally secure. It's great to have a super secret 30 character password on your Dropbox account, but if, if the password on your phone is 1234, well, that's the path of least resistance. Somebody picks up the phone, uh, plays around, keys in 1234, and they've got access to that data, even though it's protected to your, you know, by a really secure password. Okay, uh, can my cloud provider see my data? Well, if when you log in and you get a link that says, I forgot my password, and you click on that link and it leads you to a page which basically says, okay, send me a code to uh, reset my password or send me my password via email or SMS. Well, uh, that means if they can send you the password or if, they, if you can change the password, it means that they know it or can change it to something they know. And if you want your data to be secure from them, that's not what you uh, want to do, I guess. <laughs> okay, uh, one of the companies that does this right is a company uh, called Log Me In with a product called LastPass, which essentially is a way of storing your passwords. Uh, LastPass does not give the provider any knowledge of your password or a way of resetting it. If you click on forgot my password, uh, the link in LastPass is just going to email you a hint. And the hint was something that you put in. So if you, you know, said, okay, my password is, uh, you know, Kenthea Evan uh, Robin, uh, you know, and the hint might be family. Uh, that's probably too easy, but essentially, you know, a long password with a, a little hint that has meaning only to you. And if you look uh, here in LastPass's policy, uh, it says basically they don't know your password. If you have lost it, you have lost it. There is no way that they can help you uh, get it back. Um, and just an, another comment on oops, cloud storage. If uh, a cloud provider is presented with a court order to turn over data, they have to do it. Again, that is their business. They cannot uh, you know, be in legal trouble for not doing it. But if, like LastPass, they don't know it, they say, here it is, it's all encrypted. We have no way of decrypting it. Um, you know, your, your data is safe from prying eyes. Okay, I hope I've answered some questions um, about what is cloud storage, what kind of cloud storage. I thank you all for listening and you know, are there any questions or comments? Yeah, Ken, this is Harry, I've got a couple of points. Okay. One, I thought people might be interested in knowing why the term cloud is used to describe this. And it comes from the fact that when network diagrams for the internet were uh, initially being created, someone would put a computer on the left side of the paper and they put a user's terminal on the right side of the paper and they were connected by a whole bunch of routers that talked one to the next to the next to the, to the next and rather than drawing all of those routers they would just draw a big squiggly lined circle that looked vaguely like a cloud and they would connect the computer into the cloud 
and the terminal into the cloud, and that's your network diagram. And that's yeah. where the term cloud comes from in all of this. Uh, excellent point. Thank you, Harry. And the second point is that with some of these um, services, I'm thinking specifically of OneDrive on Windows, you've got to be careful because when OneDrive is enabled and it's syncing your data to the cloud, it can interfere with the operation of some programs, especially if the program utilizes an internal database that is constantly being updated. It can, it can really mess up uh, your, your database, unfortunately. And yeah. so if you have a situation like that, I'm speaking specifically with OneDrive, then what you want to do rather than having your data in the partition that is synced to OneDrive, you want to have your data somewhere segregated from that. And then when you close down your application, the last thing you should do is tell it to make a backup of your data into some known place. And then after the program has exited, drag that backup into the OneDrive synchronization area. That way, you can have a, a secure backup of your data without the program and, and OneDrive interfering with each other. Yes, uh, I, I've had that problem, not with a database, but uh, by default, OneDrive synchronizes your desktop. That can get very confusing when suddenly the, the icons that were on the desktop of one machine turn up on the desktop of another machine. So I, I've also had that. And basically, uh, I believe there's a way of telling OneDrive not to synchronize your desktop or to, to remove folders from uh, OneDrive synchronization. Otherwise, uh, it can at times cause confusion. It, there are ways to do that. It's a little confusing and a little complicated. I personally have OneDrive entirely disabled. I don't like it, but that's mm -hmm. a personal thing, yeah. you know. Yeah, I, I just keep it isolated. You know, I said I know which which folders, which directories are uh, synchronized, and you know, I, I make sure that uh, moving them over to another machine or making them accessible on another machine. Uh, does not cause uh, great amounts of internal laughter. Thank you for both those excellent points, Harry. Is there, are there any other questions or comments? And you know, what's the difference yes. between something called a cloud and a, um, a network a uh, backup drive accessible from everything within your local area network and accessible from the outside. What's, what's the difference in these? It's basically the same thing. The, uh, the backup drive, if it's accessible, if the data is accessible, then it's really, uh, you know. No, Cloud. Cloud storage is really just an extension of a local network attached drive. It's just more implementation and, and easier to get to. When we think of a cloud, when we think of a cloud, nice white. Well, it's gray and ugly, or it could be a thunderstorm or a blizzard. We don't know. But the point is, is that the boundary between the cloud and everything else is fuzzy and indistinct. In plain English, you don't know exactly where it is. You can't nail it down. That's because it's likely to change over time. You know, the amount of clouds that we see is going to vary with the weather. In this case, it's going to vary with the internet weather report. You know? Jammed today, you know, wide open highway over here, etc. You don't know, and the data center people who are storing your data are going to take advantage of the place where it flows the least expensive and the quickest. 
So you don't know where that stuff is in the cloud that you don't. You just don't. On the other hand, if it's your drive and it's on your premises, this is something very, very specific. You know exactly where it is, what it is, how to use it, and, <laughs> and, and how much you can put on it, and it's your responsibility to do so. Right. That is why I you know, included things like private cloud and own cloud. Right. Yeah. Now, when you go to these cloud providers, you're entrusting them with your data, and you just hope that it's a good business to be one problem. Right. <laughs> Um, yeah, medical and HIPAA data is a very special type of data, uh, and the, the, you need to negotiate that with your cloud your cloud provider, uh, and, and I'm not sure that something like a Dropbox or a OneDrive would be suitable for uh, medical data that HIPAA rules apply to. Right, right. And just, yeah. The use case of the data is different. Certainly the privacy concerns are much different. There's lots of laws and legal regulations. On the other hand, your X-ray or your, you know, your scan, whatever it may be, is probably a .jpeg file. And as yes. such, you can look at that thing, you can't tell what it is. Besides being this strange looking drawing, you know, if it's a, a Doppler sound drawing or an MRI of me, I know I have plenty of those. Um, it looks like a picture. And you know, the data isn't special, it's the use case for the right. data that surrounds it. Can? Yes. For Sorry. those interested in personal clouds, there are such things as, for example, and I'm not pushing this for any reason, it's just I happen to own one. Uh, companies like Western Digital have products, in, in particular theirs is called My Cloud. And it's nothing more than a bank of disk drives that are configured in a RAID environment so that they're uh, error correcting and self redundant. It plugs into your router and you can then access it from any device plugged into your router. And if you have a publicly accessible IP address for your home network, then that data becomes accessible over the network as well. So it's like a commercial cloud, only it's yours on in your house. No there. Well, uh, th there's redundancy. So, some of them, like, is it ubiquity? Uh, I think they, they do have redundancy, but only within the walls of your house. If, if there's a fire, earthquake, uh, you know, the, the redundancy there is just going to prevent protect you against failure of any single drive or two drives or whatever. Correct. But, yeah. Something that's going to flatten your house is, is not going to do anything for that type of storage unless you happen to also have a copy stored somewhere else. This is the whole idea of off-premise backup. If off-premise backup is online, then it's a cloud. If off-premise backup is offline, then it's like a box in the storage room somewhere. Yes. Uh, the one, I guess, comment about off or online off-premise data is it will protect you against a lot of dangers. The one danger it will not protect you against is ransomware. Ransomware will basically attack any storage that is online and encrypted. So you want your backups of really, really important data to be offline, or you might even do uh, like I do is take a separate hard drive, back it up and store it somewhere else not connected to my computer. It might not be the exact current data, but it's better than losing all my data. 
Uh, Ken? Yes. Uh, just uh, for everyone to be aware, the people in the room, if they don't get near your microphone, we're not hearing them clearly all the time. It's just muffled. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm trying to aim the microphone at them, but it's, you know, it, it's just meant to be a, a microphone built into my PC for me to talk in. So uh, at times, if you can't hear, I guess, speak up or send the chat message and I'll repeat it. I have a question. Yeah. Um, Google, did you... But you got a Gmail account, you need to do a whole bunch of things required to Gmail account. And one of them is God. And it's whatever they need to do is uh, five days, ten days, fifteen days. So I decided not to do that. That's what I would use for additional storage and I could have what two hundred gigs. And then you can download the desktop. So now you have the desktop with access to it. You have the Gmail uh, accessory items. They have into it. And then I also wound up with something with the Google symbol called My Drive. And those three things have become very confusing at times. I assume they're all synced because they're all under the One Drive name. But when it's called My Drive, it's simply taken out of that Google Drive name. And is that everything that's synced? What they call it My Drive. Um. Not sure. I guess the way to test would be to add a file to one of them and see if it appears on the others. I think the only one that has something like that, right? Where they download the desktop application and keep that one on any device. And then you have to download the desktop application and keep that one on any device. And then it also is part of the Gmail structure. Yeah, I think, I think Amazon, well, at least for their photos, will allow you to have a you know, an app that will you know make it appear as if it's local. If you ever decide not to pay your fine, make sure you get all your photos off. Yeah, that's yeah. Uh, yeah. An interesting thing. Yeah, they're, they're, they're okay. Yeah, this is Paul. Hey, yeah. Paul. Yeah, how you doing? I wanted to find out if you had ever had any problems getting a file from. Google Drive to a flash drive. Let's say you you know you have a lot of files in Google Drive. I've tried it. I, I'll, take, I'll transfer the file. Uh, what I think is the file that might be ten pages in that file, and I'll transfer it to a flash drive. Okay, two two people are talking at once. Computer. What it does is it brings up, it, you know, it'll bring, it, it'll look for for the uh, for the file on the cloud. It doesn't have those ten pages there. You know, am I doing something wrong, or you know, have you tried that before? Okay, I'm sorry, Paul. Could you repeat that? You were talking, and Richie was talking at the same time. I was doubling. Right. Okay. All right, I'll try again. Have you had problems taking a file from, let's say, Google Drive? And putting it onto a flash drive. I've done it, and let's say I'll take a file, and there might be ten pages on that file. I would like to, you know, put it onto onto the uh, flash drive, and I've done that. But then you take the flash drive out, and you plug it into another computer, and you try to bring up the, the ten pages on your computer, and it's not there. The only thing that's there is like a link to go back to your Google Drive, and then it will get the pages from that Google Drive. You know, that, that's the problem I've had. I've not had that problem. Um, uh, can I can speak to that. Okay. It's probably operator error. Okay. No, no. What's happening no. is that when you're doing the drag and drop from Google Drive, it's dragging a shortcut. It's not dragging the file. Okay. And that's what you're seeing on that second computer. One way to... Um, ensure that you've got the real file is open up the document and then save the open copy to a different location that's not in the the google drive mm -hmm. okay I'm okay I'm save it the hard drive on my on my computer and then from the computer save save it to the, to 
to the uh, flash drive. My goal is to get it onto the flash drive. Yeah, save it to your computer locally and then okay. drag that to the flash drive. Do not save it directly to the flash drive. You can run into problems uh, when you try and save things to flash drives. Not always, but sometimes they 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 don't okay. save okay. properly if it's from inside a running application as opposed to just a drag and drop. Yeah. Okay, I'll um, do that. Thank you, Harry. Okay, Harry, have you tried right clicking on a file doing a copy and then pasting it onto the uh, flash drive uh no i have not okay uh, I, I was just curious because i ha have not had this problem uh I, I it's very possible that i never tried dragging a file from a google drive to uh, a flash drive it's something i'm going to give a try and there's also isn't there an explicit download button a download button that you, then you select the file or files. No. The regular drive is sent to FS. That may be the root of those problems. So you try to drag all the NTFS data onto a factory two drive. It's not going to work. We don't hear George. Okay. Uh, do you think also when you copy, when you need the file or whatever, there is an option. Do you want to use the link or do you want to copy? Okay, we've, we've had two comments here. Uh, one of them was from George, who uh, thought that uh, the problem might be because of the formatting of the drives, where one being FAT32 and the other being NTFS. Uh, and Richie had a comment that you may be given an option of whether you want to link the file or actually copy the file. Um, to George's point, I tend to doubt that that's the problem because the drive stack that is used to access a file on FAT32 and the <laughs> drive stack that will access it on NTFS will automatically convert from one to the other as it's transferring through the through the computer. Okay, this is I have used I guess Google Drive the question was is can we re recommend one of the uh, cloud storage providers over another as far as a hard drive. Uh, I have used the, the major players. I have not had a problem with Google or with uh, Amazon or with OneDrive. Uh, I have, uh, I, I'm not sure if you call it a problem with Dropbox, where Dropbox has changed the uh, restrictions of their free service. Their free service now, you can only have one type of device on. So you can save uh, up to, uh, I think it's five gig on only uh, the com computers, let's say. Uh, you cannot sync it to a phone or a tablet unless you use one of their pay for services, uh, which are you know, not horribly expensive, but uh, they don't offer that service for free like the other providers do. I have a question. Uh, yes, go ahead, Gary. Uh, my question is, is specifically about backing up a computer, using, using cloud storage for backup, not necessarily for sharing. Uh, the question is whether uh, you'd recommend uh, just like moving your documents folder to, let's say Dropbox, and uh, and then you're storing your your auto you're automatically uh, backing up your documents because you're storing them in a folder that's uh, synced to Dropbox. Or uh, is there some advantage to using some of these fancy uh, backup software programs like uh, I've heard of GoodSync? Um, I'm sure there's others. Is there some advantage for using you know backup software as opposed to just you know, choosing where you store your files. Well, one of the advantages of backup software 
is the fact that you can choose a level of compression. So you may be Mac backing up, let's say, 100 megabytes of text files. Text files are very easy to compress. So the backup may be only 25 megabytes. So uh, I mean that, that's the advantage of using backup software. Uh, and my caveat uh, before, as far as protection from ransomware, if, if it's online, it's still in danger. Another point, if I may, if you, Go ahead, think, uh, if, if you think in terms of putting your document folder into Dropbox or OneDrive, and actually the document folder is what OneDrive backs up by default, if I remember correctly you can run into that problem that I was talking about where a program is writing to a file in the document folder and OneDrive is trying to back it up simultaneously and it may not get the most recent update and they, they can get in each other's way. It's an unfortunate design decision and design flaw in my view that has allowed that sort of thing to happen. So, those my programs personal can't preference. What, those programs can't detect whether files are open and, and simply wait until the file is no longer open in an application before it's... Uh, yeah, and what about an application that opens the file and leaves it open for the entire time the application is running? Uh-huh, right. Yeah. Um, my personal preference for that sort of thing is to do backups non real time you do your work you make a backup and then you pull that backup file into a directory that is backed up automatically okay. so that so that and it might or might not be the document folder you know depending upon how you lay things out but that okay. way you can avoid the problem of the backup software interacting with the running application mm -hmm. Okay, there are also options on opens, but I'm getting, I guess, into the, the nitty gritty of writing the software, where you can say open for exclusive control, or open for shared control. Uh, and that will really determine how often the, the buffers in your computer memory are written out to uh, the actual physical storage. So uh, that may also help you. Unfortunately, that's up to the person that wrote the software. Uh, and they may or may not give the user options of using that facility of saying, hey, I, this is, I'm you know, going to write to it immediately, write out the buffers. Uh, that is up to the author. And if the person writing the software wasn't thinking in terms of cloud backup, real-time synchronization of data, they may not have given that any consideration at all when they decided how they were opening the file and they might have uh, written it the wrong way, quote unquote. Right. And it's not even the wrong way. For example, remember DB2 back thousands of years ago? Uh, not DB2, DBase2. Um, you know, at the time, they weren't thinking of sharing these files over the network. And I at bet the there time GBase 2 came out, there wasn't a network. Everything was right. dial up to talk to another machine. Right. So, you know, they, they may not have, you know, they, there weren't even considerations of doing this. So, uh, it's one of the things I guess you have to be aware of. You need to have network uh, aware software. Uh, if you want to, uh, you know, synchronize live data. Yeah, my point was not that it can't be done, but that you have to be careful about the application you're using and determine whether it was written to allow that sort of thing or not. Right. And I older mean, programs that have been around for years that you're still using because they still do the job that you need them to do, almost guaranteed they will not be compatible with OneDrive updates. Yeah, that's, I guess that's why Harry is recommending that what you do is what once you've closed down the program, then you copy it to OneDrive. 
so you don't have to worry about the program having it open. That's a good idea. I have uh, another question is um, in terms of choosing which of these cloud storage uh, uh, programs you use, I know it's not a problem. I've seen computers have both a Dropbox and OneDrive, you know, and Google Drive on them. Uh, but do you know if it's an issue if your corporate environment has the same cloud storage? In other words, is it possible for a computer to have uh, two, two Dropbox accounts on it, one for your corporate Dropbox and one for your private? Uh, I do not believe that is, matter of fact, I know it's not possible because I have uh, two accounts. One is my personal account and one is for the uh, Long Island CW Club. And I, I cannot open both of those at the same time without going through the trick of opening up an incognito session on my browser. In that case, it will work, but you, you, you have to go through some uh, hoops to make it work. And you think that applies to all of the, all the uh, storage, the OneDrive as well? And I think it applies to all of them. Basically, they get their uh, you know, credentials uh, from whatever environment you're running them in, and unless you run something like incognito mode to isolate the users. Uh, now you can only be logged on as one user at a time. Yeah, okay, makes sense. Okay, do we have any other questions, comments? Okay, I thank you all for listening to me and for participating. Uh, this last slide, you know, please join us on the computer net if you want to talk about these things. Uh, or you can email me at my call, wb2kwc at limark.org. Thank you all. Uh, have a good evening. You're welcome.